So let's be honest, who grew up watching Mr. Rogers, right? So I would go over to my grandma's house, and she always made sure we watched Mr. Rogers. By the way, my grandmother is 98 years old. I just talked to her a couple days ago. She is still kicking. She was in the hospital last week, but, you know, they just keep kicking her out, and she keeps going. Um, But you know what? When we look back on Mr. Rogers, right, we might laugh a little bit because, you know, let's just be honest. Some of those puppets were creepy. Let's just keep it real. Like that one with the long nose, I don't know. I used to have some nightmares about that. But, uh, you know, Mr. Rogers was pretty progressive. I don't know if y'all realize, and that's why I played this video. He started out in 1970. Did you know he was a Presbyterian pastor? Called to ministry and said, I want to reach kids at a broader, uh, in a broader way. And uh, he did things kind of like real low-key under the radar. So back in 1970, imagine what America was like, right? And uh, desegregation of schools had just happened. And there was even in the public uh, swimming pools, they wanted to keep them segregated. So he silently protested on his show by inviting one of his black neighbors over, having a swimming pool, and he took his shoes off and he invited his friend he said come on kick off your shoes and let's put our shoes in the water and we watch that today and we think no big deal he was he was radical for his day right um now we've all had good neighbors and bad neighbors right now I grew up with Mr. Rogers and you know he was everybody's friend right everybody loved him uh and I have some great neighbors like right now we've got some neighbors they're the kind of people who just You know, if you need an extra cup of sugar, I was out of eggs the other day. My neighbor's like, hey, here's some eggs, you know. Those like neighbors that just do stuff for you. And then I remember some other neighbors. Anybody have those other neighbors? Like I remember straight up in Minneapolis, we had some neighbors. I forgot to lock my front door, and I walked out. My neighbors came in and robbed us blind. When we were at, I was at McDonald's, and I came back, and like stuff was gone. I know it was my neighbors. They saw me leaving. So... So, you know, there's a question about neighbors, but we're going to be talking about what, what's it like to be a good neighbor, right? So we're finishing, we're crossing the finish line on our series called Show Me Your ID. We started out asking the question, who am I, right? And I'll, I'll take you back. We'll do a little review. We talked about our perceived identity, right? We can live by identity of what other people slap our labels on us. We can live by our past identity, right, of things we've said and done in the past. Or we can live by our perceived ide- identity, and that's how God sees us, right? And then we talked about who is Jesus. We talked about how Jesus is our God, but he's also our Savior, but ultimately he's our friend, right? And then we said, hey, who are we as a church, and we said, hey, we, as a church, this is a place for us to belong, believe, and come on, y'all are getting it. That's right. Oh, and John John finished it. All that God created you to be. And this week, we're going to wrap up our series by talking about who is my neighbor. Now, how many remember story time as a kid? I mean, I remember kindergarten, right? And the teacher would gather us around and say, kids, it's story time, right? Uh, did you know that Jesus told 46 stories in the Bible? 46 of them. We call them parables. They were just stories, right? Which kind of proves that stories aren't just for little kids, right? Stories are for us, too. So I want us to think about this. Stories should engage us at three levels, okay? They should engage our heads, our hearts, and our hands. And I want you to be thinking about this as we read this story today. It should engage our intellect. It should challenge us to have a different perspective. It should engage our hearts. It should cultivate empathy. It should move us emotionally. And it should engage our hands, which represents we should do things different, right? We should live different. We should act different. So stories engage us at those three levels. One of my favorite stories and the one we're going to talk about tonight is the story of the Good Samaritan. In fact, this one's so popular, we still name stuff after this story, right? Over 2,000 years later, the hospital right down the street from me, if I were needing to go to the ER, I would go to Good Samaritan Hospital, right? Right there in Puyallup, right? Uh, I hope I don't need to go anytime soon. Uh, But if I do need to go, I'm going to Good Samaritan. And so, we're going to read the story of the Good Samaritan and imagine Jesus telling uh, his, 
people who he was sharing the story. And when Jesus talked, people just kind of leaned in. So I want to kick us off tonight with just reading straight from the word. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to Luke 10, 25. If not, we're going to have it up on the screen. And let's read the story. Uh, These are Jesus' words, right? So these are red letter words straight from Jesus. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. How many know people like to test Jesus? You You ever have people in your life that test you, right? Your kids, your neighbors, you just people testing you, right? People always tested Jesus. Teacher, they asked, what, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus responded, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Don't you love when people answer your question with a question? You ever notice that's a tool Jesus did on purpose? Why do you think he did that? He wanted them to think. For themselves, right? By the way, if you're a parent, this is a great tool for your kids or your teenagers or your spouse, right? Ask them a question. All right, sidetrack there. Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus. He needed a little clarity. He said, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus said, okay, this guy's testing me. I'm going to break out a story. So in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was and saw him. He took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn. And took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and I'll return. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Here's another question he asks. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. It was Margaret Thatcher who said this. She said, no one would remember the good Samaritans, the good Samaritan, if he only had good intentions. He's known for his actions, right? And here's the double standard that we all live with, right? I want you to catch this because it's so true. I want people to judge me by my intentions, but I typically judge other people by their actions, right? So who is our neighbor, and what does it mean to be a good neighbor, and what was Jesus really trying to tell us through this story? I want to invite up our table team, give them a hand, Michael and Satricia Passion. So, okay. So here's the question of the day. Did you watch Mr. Rogers growing up? I did not. You didn't. But the Daniels Tiger neighborhood is like a remake of that. It is. So So you're kind of on the 2.0. Yeah, my children watch that. Yeah, kids watch that. So my grandma would try to put me to sleep (laughs) with Mr. Rogers, and then I'd turn up again with Sesame Street. (laughs) That's right. She tried. But Mr. Rogers, he was cool. And you could tell there was he was so calm. I think right? that's what made me tired. Right. <laughs> it was so peaceful. He would put you to sleep. Yeah, like sometimes. 20 pairs of shoes, you know, like this. <laughs> 20 pairs of the same shoe. Yeah, of the same shoe. And how many cardigans were in there all lined up? Yeah, fashion. I know. But when they went to that one puppet, it was like nightmare, nightmare for me. So we're going to break down the story and what Jesus really wanted us to grab a hold of. There's three truths in the story. Uh, and Michael, kick us off. So, like you said, when I read that story, it was like, my first thought was like, yo, that's a really good story, right? Yeah. 
And then my analytical break down the word side was like, okay, so what is it about this guy that makes him so good? Like, he's the good Samaritan. So I kind of did some little scriptural research. Yeah. And so my conclusion was, we call him the good Samaritan because he has the trait of God. God is good. Yeah, all, the time. all the time. And all the time. God, God is, is good. good. So God has this reputation about yeah. him that yeah. he's just a good God, right? right? right. And we can see that when he was selfless and he went to help this stranger, mm -hmm. yeah. we see the reflection of God doing above and beyond what others wouldn't do. That's good. Right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was my take on that. So let's do this, you guys. Let's go to Psalms chapter 23, mm -hmm. verse 5 and 6. Psalms 23, a lot of us probably know this, the scripture, yeah. the Lord is my shepherd, yeah. I yeah. shall not want. He yeah. lead it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty pretty famous. Yeah. But I want to take a look at yeah. verse 5 and 6. Let's take a look at verse 5 and 6. It says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Mm -hmm. You anoint my head with oil. Yeah. My cup runs over. Mm -hmm. Surely goodness and mercy mm -hmm. shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Say this with me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow Follow. All, all the days, all the of, days my life. of my life. So look, let's, let's go ahead and do a recap, okay? So this man, this stranger, he's walking down a certain street or a back road in Jerusalem all by himself. All of a sudden, he gets mobbed. He gets attacked mm -hmm. by who? The Bible doesn't say who, no. right? They jump him. They take his goods. They take his money. They strip him naked. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he's left for dead. So you have a priest that walks by, mm -hmm. looks at him for whatever reason, doesn't help. Yeah. Then you have a, a Levite right. that walks by. Another religious guy. Another religious yeah. person, doesn't do anything. Yeah. And then here comes our hero, the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. He comes and he sees him. And in my mind, I like to, so when I read the Bible, I like to really like use my, my sanctified imagination, <laughs> right? So I would think of my sanctified imagination that while this guy is being bandaged and he's being helped by this stranger, mm -hmm. I would think in my mind, he would think, you know what, God? Thank you. Because when I thought I was by myself, yeah. goodness good. and mercy was following me down that alley. That's yeah. good. Yeah. When I thought that I was abandoned and abused and yeah. jumped and stole from, yeah. goodness and mercy was following me the yeah. whole time. Yeah. Ain't that crazy? That's yeah. Good. So That's God good. is good. So All one thing that really stood out to me is this. Out of all the people that should have helped him, right. Yes. Right. Yeah. why wasn't he helped by the priest, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the one that you would yeah. expect? So if anybody yeah. really doesn't know, priests and Levites, their whole job yeah. was to serve God in the temple. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody was supposed to represent God, if anybody was supposed to represent That's the right. love of God, yeah. it should have been these two cats, sure. right? Yes. And they didn't do yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. So my, my question to you guys. Yeah. What in your life or what situations in your life have you seen where you expected somebody yeah. to hit the front lines and help, but they didn't do it? Yeah, mm. there's I think there's so many problems in society mm -hmm. as a whole. Right. Yes. Yeah. That we think somebody else is going to help with. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. so, for example, we look at poverty. Right. And we think, oh, the government, we got assistance. Right. There's mm -hmm. there's programs for that. Right. Yes. Uh, we think of foster care. You know, foster care are our current day orphan yes, orphans yes. right mm -hmm. and so we think oh well well you know social services there's programs for yeah. that right yeah. I, f I think there's a lot of things we think somebody else will take care of it somebody else will fix it we look at refugees we think well somebody in nato should take care of that yeah, right yes, yes. yeah any, any? you know i think maybe like terrorism I think yeah. I don't, when I hear of it, I think, oh, but I don't take time to pray for it. Right. And even right. though I can't go over there, I'm not in the army, I'm not going to go fight, but I could mm -hmm. spend 10 minutes praying right. about it. But right. that's one thing I, I kind of leave, right. you know. Yeah. Well, I, I look at it like a big pie, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if we all do our little sliver, because yeah. it's the prayer that inspires people mm -hmm. to do things when God mm -hmm. moves on their heart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Even if it's, it's even if it's a social service or anything like that. Yeah. 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 But, um. Let me give you guys a little history lesson and, yeah. and tell why is it that Christians, why is it that we as people of God, what makes us to be inspired mm -hmm. to actually show love? Right. So let me give you guys a little history lesson. I just learned this. So in the second century, 
there was a plague called the Antony Plague, right? Yeah. And it killed over 60 million people in Rome. Mm. Now, if you look at the numbers on COVID, was it about? Well, a, million. about a million. We just passed a million here in a, just in the U.S. Wow. Okay. We passed a million. So just to give you yeah. the dynamics of how severe, 60 million, y'all. That's okay? a lot of people. <laughs> so when everyone else left the sick to die, it yeah. was the Christians who felt yeah. a conviction to go care for those in need and serve on the front lines. Yeah. During that time, Christians were persecuted. They were despised. But their response to the plague actually earned them more favor mm -hmm. because they were the ones that showed the faith. Yeah. Now, what was it that made them want to put their self in harm's way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we got the scripture? Yep. Matthew 25, 38 through 40. This is what Jesus said. He said, well, they said to him, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in mm -hmm. or needing clothes or mm -hmm. to clothe you? Yeah. When did we see you sick or in prison or go visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, yeah. you did it for me. Yeah. So if you can yeah. imagine whoever we help, mm -hmm. those children, you're really actually helping God yeah. because we're a body. Yeah. We're one body. Yeah. So when I reach out to my brother, I'm actually reaching out to, mm -hmm. to the Lord because mm -hmm. the Lord is in you and he's in me. Yeah. And that yeah. was the inspiration behind so all good. of that plague helping. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so good. Yeah. So love moves beyond empathy. It can get messy. Right. But love is always a form of action. Yeah. yeah. If you love me. Yeah. Do my commandments. That's yeah. right. We don't want it all this lip service. No, nah, love. Love is messy. Right. But yeah. it always moves yeah. into action. That's so yes. good. That's so, so good. What do you get from this story? Babe. <laughs> 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 um, what I get from it is that love should be limitless. Yeah. It shouldn't mm. have a limit. And mm -hmm. I get this because in the story, you know, the Jewish man, when you think it's his own people mm -hmm. who didn't help him. Right. And, right. you know, back in those days, the Samaritans and the Jewish people, they hated each right. other because the Jewish people kind of looked at them with their nose up like, right. oh, you guys are half breeds. I don't want mm -hmm. any part with you. Mm -hmm. But it was yeah. the man that was looked down upon. Right that came and loved on him, right? That's yeah. That's good. And he did it without reason. He did it without limit. And so yeah. when I look back and I'm like, why didn't, why didn't the priest help? Mm -hmm. Why didn't the, the Levite mm -hmm. help? Why didn't they help him? And I can form some, some assumptions. Right. You know, it doesn't right. say clearly, but maybe they were fearing breaking the purity law because mm -hmm. maybe when they saw the man, they weren't sure if he was on his last breath. Right. And right. if he if they touched him, you know, they would have had to clean for like seven days. Right. So maybe they had a wedding the next day or mm -hmm. something that they had. And they're like, look, I can't risk it. Right. That's seven right. days. I'm going to be out of commission <laughs> and I don't want right. to risk it. Mm -hmm. It could have been the fear of being robbed themselves. Like, have you ever heard a story where somebody's like, you know, at that 7-Eleven, somebody got shot. Right. You know, every right. time I go by the 7-Eleven, I'm going to have my keys in my hands ready. <laughs> I'm going to be looking around. I'm going to try That's to right. avoid the 7-Eleven. If I heard somebody got shot even two years ago. I'm going right. to go to the uh, gas the station one. across the street <laughs> just right. in case, you just know. Case. So maybe they feared that they were going to be robbed, too. Right. So maybe right. that's the reason that they yeah. kept walking, too. We don't know why, mm -hmm. but they, they kept walking. Yeah. And the Samaritan, he didn't let those limitations. He didn't let fear. He didn't that's let good. the possibility of being unclean. Mm -hmm. He didn't let any of those things yeah. limit him and what he did. That's and good. so it says that not only did he see them, the man, he took pity on him. Mm -hmm. Not only did he take pity on him, he washed and bandaged him, which is messy. Like you said, love is messy, you know? Mm -hmm. He washed and bandaged him. He took him to a hotel. He paid yeah. two denarii. And back in those days, a denarii was a day wage. So yeah. two of them, so two whole days That's of hard of labor, you yeah. know, that he paid for that man That's to stay there. That's a couple there. hundred bucks, right? Yeah. In our, and it likes to translate yes. to today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he could have used on himself, but mm -hmm. he paid for the man to stay there. And then he went back to check on him and said, he'll pay whatever difference. Mm. So even without the limit of fear and without the limit of what could yeah. happen, he was limit, limitless in his giving too. So he didn't say, I'm going to bandage you and then hopefully you feel better. Right. Yeah. He didn't say, I'm going to bandage you and I'm going to yeah. take you there. Maybe one day, <laughs> right. like it was without limit. He yeah. had, he let him stay yeah. there. He went yeah. back and checked and That's paid good. whatever it was necessary. Yeah. You know, so um, we're living in a time where division is rampant, you yeah. know, yeah. what are some ways that you see in the culture today that we're divided? or that we're limited in how we show love? You know, I think, you know, this neighborhood alone, and we've said this before, 135 different nationalities just here in Federal Way, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so the religion divides us, right? Cultures and ethnicities, language, some, you know, sometimes, you know, there's people that walk by and I try to talk to them and we speak a different language, right? So there's a barrier there. I I often think of my Muslim friends. Uh, I've become really good friends with uh, our neighbors two doors down from Pakistan, Rashida and Muhammad. And they last year were finishing up Ramadan, right? And they do this celebration uh, called Eid something. And, Mm -hmm. And so as they were breaking, it, um, you know, I was talking to her about what that celebration is. And of course, they're celebrating God's provision because uh, of Abraham, you know, God providing for the sacrifice. Now, they believe it was Ishmael. Ishmael. We believe it was Isaac. But can I tell you, we found the common ground. And I said, but God is our provider, Provider. right? And so there's a lot of barriers even uh, from different religions that I think a lot of times fear keeps us, don't you think? I mean, just fear of the unknown, fear of the, you know, us and them mentality. And yet, there are commonalities, you know, that can break down those walls. Yeah. yeah, that is very true. And so, one, I want to give a shout out to our neighbors. Our neighbors are sitting over there. Whoop, they, whoop. They, they have loved us so limitlessly. Mm-hmm. They have loved us continually and yeah. through and through. They've sacrificed. They've been there helping fixing the car. Um, <laughs> their son was even mowing our lawn today. Now so that's they a have good loved, neighbor right there. Yes, they've loved <laughs> us so much since we moved in there. So I wanted to give them a shout out. But one of the ways, too, that we're limited, you know, we're limited sometimes or we're separated by politics. Mm-hmm. We're, we're separated by racial tensions. Yeah. You know, we're, sep- we're separated yeah. even within the body of Christ right? with denominations. Right. Right. Yeah. Sprinkle on the water, right. dip in, <laughs> skirts, no skirts. Like yeah. there's so many things that divide us today. Right. True, and when I true. think about like culturally, some yeah. of the things that divide yeah. us, I think about this story. Um, I had a friend. Uh, so my friend, she's Caucasian. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a couple years ago, there was a woman who had a knife and she was mm-hmm. dealing with mental illness. Yeah. And she the police killed her in front of her five children. Mm-hmm. And so it was like a high tension kind of time yeah. racially. And yeah. so everybody was kind of going back and forth. There was like this argument like we see yeah. a lot in the news. I remember that story. Yeah. yeah. And so my friend, she's a hairstylist and she did the hair of the police chief who was over the case. Mm -hmm. And when the police chief was in the chair, she kept on putting emphasis on like, you know, these police officers weren't racist. They this and all these great things about the police officers. And so my friend was sharing the same um, belief as her. And my first initial thought was, you know what, when we get done, I'm not talking to her no more. (laughs) Because if she doesn't get it now, then I don't know if this needs to be my friend. But I, I took a moment and I didn't allow their ignorance to limit me in how I showed love to her. So instead of like arguing or being offended, I just thought in my mind, she doesn't know what it's like to be black. She's yeah. never been raised yeah. black, you know? Yeah. So she doesn't understand yeah. the viewpoint that I might have because she only knows yeah. what she's experienced yeah. in her lifetime. Yeah, true, true. So I broke it down for her. I said, you know, even if it had nothing to do with race, mm-hmm. there was a person mm-hmm. who only had a knife who was killed in front of their children. And mm-hmm. even if they're the, the police were great people, maybe, maybe the issue yeah. isn't race. Maybe the issue is the lack of preserving of life. Humanity, because if yeah. we would if that was the police officer's son that had the knife, I can guarantee That's you right. that he would have found a That's way to right. dis- disarm him without killing him. You know yeah. So have. the issue right. is usually not about race. Like a lot of the times when things like this happen, it's either fear. Maybe the police officer is afraid. They don't know what this other person's gonna do. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of times it's not even even those, you know, it's not race that is the issue. It's either fear or it's a lack of love or a limit in love. Like, I love you this much, but you got a knife and I don't care enough about your life. I want to make sure I don't get stabbed. So I'm just going to shoot you and I don't care if you die, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And yeah. so when I look at these different things that, yeah. you know, continue to divide yeah. us and I look at the limits and we have the opportunity sometimes to, to be limitless in the way that we don't, we don't hold against people what they don't know. Mm. We don't hold against uh, people what they're culturally different because yeah. even raising my children, there's a way that I have to raise my children right. that's different than my friend that's Caucasian. Yeah. And it's yeah. not that it's intentional like I'm saying, that's I'm right. going to do this, but there's that's experiences right. that my that's children right. have that my friend that her children will never have. That's right. And so unfortunately, because of this, I have to raise yeah. my children in a different yeah. kind of way. I have yeah. to put emphasis yeah. on certain kind of things to make that they're make sure that they're trained up and ready for the world who that's doesn't right. have, um, right. that has limits on how they mm-hmm. love people, you know, yeah. and 
people of color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can I just say thank you for your patience <laughs> and that perspective, too, because, you know, my my cousin is an interracial marriage and has biracial children. And I remember living life and seeing things differently through her eyes when my kids were back in the 16 years old getting their driver's license, and she would have to have different conversations with her kids than my kids. And that was a light bulb moment for me. And I was like, wow, things are not all equal on a playing field here. Like, this is very, very different. And so, you know, having these open conversations, how many know we need to talk about the hard stuff? Yeah. Even in church, right? Yeah. Are y'all y'all okay? Y'all doing a, just a little pulse check, <laughs> right? We can talk about racism in church. Come on, somebody, yeah. right? We can keep it real and keep it, uh, you know, f focused on faith and learn something from each yeah. other. So thank you for having that perspective. Thank you. Well, praise yeah. God. I praise God that he you know, gave me the patience because I hear a lot of people say, oh, it's exhausting this, but right. people only know what they're taught or what they It's ignorance. Yeah. It's ignorance. Yeah. yeah. So we have to be yeah. willing to see both sides, right. you know, see the police mm -hmm. officer's side, see the friend's side, see yep. the, the children's side, mm -hmm. see everyone's side. Um, and one last little story about that too. Um, another example I shared with her to help her kind of understand yeah. is when all that stuff was going on, I got pulled over and my first thought was, okay, what do I do? Okay, put my hands on the steering wheel. Mm. Okay, what, what mm. was this? Like, I had all mm. these panic kind of things that mm. went through my mind. I thought, mm. oh, I should be recording. Oh, is there somebody? So I'm looking around mm. to see if there are people around that are watching. Yeah. And me, who I've been so far removed from, like, the streets and all that yeah. kind of stuff for years, I know that I'm not doing anything illegal. Right. There's no reason for me mm -hmm. to feel afraid or feel mm -hmm. guilty, but that's my natural reaction because yeah. of the experiences that I've yeah. had, you know? Yeah. And so when, when I broke it down to her that way, she was so, like, wow, because right. she said to herself, I got pulled over the other day, and none of those things right. crossed my mind. <laughs> right. None exactly. of those things. She was right. actually upset with the police officer, right. like, why are you stopping me, mm -hmm. you know? And so she was giving him some sass. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, without any fear of mm. anything like that. Mm. So sometimes it's just not allowing ignorance yeah. to limit us in how we love people yeah. and how we even express, you know, yeah. our experiences to other people too. Yeah. So good. So yeah, we don't have to like everybody. We don't have to get along with everybody, <laughs> but we do have to love and we have to try to understand mm. and try to be there for the people that God's called into our life. That's so good. So you know, good. I think we need to grab a hold of that one. Mm. We don't have to like people, but we do have to love them. Do yeah. have to love. Right? Yeah. That's we a don't command. have to agree with them <laughs> politically. We don't have to agree with every perspective. We don't have to agree with their lifestyle choices, but we are commanded to, to love. love them yes, as a church. Yes. I mean, I can't tell you how many people stop by during the week when we're here at the church and say, well, who can come to this church? I'm like, everybody, anybody. <laughs> like, we love, and they're like, well, but do you love these kind of people, these kind of, I'm like, yes, everybody, everybody yes. is welcome at the table. That's yes. why we call our church the table, because yes. everybody's welcome yes. at the table. You know, I love that idea that, um, you know, Love breaks barriers, even cultural and racial barriers. And, and the last thing that we see in here is that love looks outward. Okay, love looks outward. And there's three things that the Good Samaritan does. By the way, I think we need to realize that Good Samaritan was an oxymoron back in the day. The shocker of the whole story was that Jesus made the Samaritan the hero and not the religious people. Yeah. Because who was he telling the story to? The religious people. Yeah. So he's telling the story, and I'm sure they're sitting there thinking, oh, this is good. Mm -hmm. I know. I really like how this is going. Then yeah. the more the story went, they're like, wait a minute. Yes. You know, yes. you ever watch those movies that, you know, that have that plot twist at the end, you know? Mm -hmm. It was like, plot twist. Wait a minute. The good Samaritan? The man, the, the people that nobody liked, that everybody yeah. despised? You're making him the hero of yes. the story? Yes. Yeah. So the Good Samaritan, he did three things. I want to be honest here about even just myself. When I love people, I want to kind of love them, but I don't want it to cost me anything, yes, right? Yeah. Sometimes I want to love people from a distance. True, true. Like, can I just give somewhere to that organization or this or that, right? It's easier to love people from a safe distance. But here's the thing. God often sends divine interruptions in the form of people with problems, yeah. right? Divine interruptions. I like that. Divine interruptions. Like that. And so if you see a person with a problem, maybe that's God giving us an opportunity, yeah. right, to put yes. our faith into action. You know, the Samaritan easily could have tiptoed by. He could have stepped around the problem. But 
he wasn't afraid to get messy, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and my plans for the day usually focus around me, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I usually, you know, get up and I got my to-do list and, you know, you're not on it, you know, because, you know, it's my <laughs> life, right? Sometimes you are. We got Monday We got Monday night huddles, right, with our dream team. Uh, but, you know, we tend to live real lives that are kind of centered around us. But here's the thing. The story shows how divine interruptions ask us to focus outward in three ways. I want you to catch these. And they all start with T because you know how I love alliteration, people. It sticks, right? The good Samaritan, he had to take time. He took time out of his schedule, right? Like you said, he had to stop get out the bandages, right? Yeah. He had to put the man on the donkey. He had to drive the donkey to the latest, you know, hotel. I don't know how that works. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like a remote control. Now, I don't know what remote etiquette you have in your family, but in our family, when we're watching a good movie and somebody has to get a snack break or, a, you know, a bathroom break, we just all, we hit pause, right? We're just like, we'll hit pause. We'll wait for you. You know, sometimes in life, we just need to learn to hit pause. Yeah. I mean, what would it learn look like in your life when you see something going on and you're like, wait a minute, maybe this is a divine interruption. I'm going to hit pause on my plans yes. and I'm going to take time for God to do something yes. in somebody else's life. Loving our neighbor will never happen at a convenient time, <laughs> but it will always require an investment of time. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so time is the first thing he had. Number two, he had to invest his talents. Now, let's keep it real here. He didn't have to have a lot of talent. He just had to have some basic first responder yes. skills. Yes. Now, most of us know, you know, if there's a wound, you clean it out. You put a clean bandage around it, even if you have to use a shirt. Or We've, we've watched ER, right? Yeah. We've watched untold stories of the yeah. ER, right? I love all those shows, by the way. Those are my favorite. Like, is gory? I should have been a doctor. Like, I remember one time my daughter, she had stitches, and, like, she like stuff was hanging out. It was gross. And I was all up in there. I was watching the doctors. I was like, this is fascinating, right? <laughs> But he just needed the basics, right? He didn't need any special skills. Sometimes I wonder if God's just wanting us to just do the basics. I think I might have told the story of the young lady that came by a few weeks ago and she wanted to charge her phone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I let her charge her phone. She was here a couple hours. We ended up talking. And I ended up telling her, hey, I'm so sorry. We don't have more to give you. We're a brand new church. We're just a few weeks old. And she said, you know what? Thank you for spending time with me. That's all I had was time, but that's all she needed. So he spent his time, and then he spent his talents, just the basics, right? But then he spent his treasures, and you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. He spent two denarii, which today, depending on where you work, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we've we've got people from all socioeconomic uh, layers in in the in the table, Mm -hmm. but took out two denarii, and then offered to pay more. You know, hey, if he needs to stay longer and heal up, we'll pay more. And here's the thing. We don't know if the Samaritan was rich, poor, or middle class. We don't know. But we do know the point is it's not how much we have. It's how we spend what we have, right? Y'all remember the story about the widow who put in, like, the equivalent of one penny? And Jesus said, she gave more than all y'all, right? right. And they were like, what? What a minute. You know, the rich guys were like, wait, I put a couple hundred. I put a couple under G's in there, and he, she gave a penny. What do you mean? And Jesus said, you gave out of your abundance. Yes. She yeah. gave out, out of everything. Yeah. Yes. yeah. The measure is different, That's huh? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, he didn't just take time to utilize his talents. He spent his personal treasures, his finances. You know, that's why the table, one of our values is generosity. And that's why the first $1,000 we raised, we didn't keep it. We didn't pay the lights with it. We didn't even pay our lease. We gave it away to Project Rescue to help women and children out of sex trafficking. Because we want to be a generous church. Amen. Give God the glory. Amen. So who is our neighbor? Hmm. Here's the definition for you. Our neighbor is anyone. Say anyone. Anyone. Anyone in need. Anyone Anyone in need. In unexpected places. In unexpected places. And inconvenient times. In inconvenient times. Huh? That's who our neighbor is. Amen. Amen. I want to invite the worship team up and thanks my dream team, Team Table. Give them a hand. Yes. 